Thank you, Dick. Well, I would like to welcome everybody this morning, and um, uh, I, I, I particularly appreciated the take me out to the ball game, um, having having come back. Unfortunately, I identify with the um, uh, the three strikes you're out. Uh, uh, I I, uh, I didn't have the best time at the plate, but I had a great um, great camp behind the plate, um, and um, so um, let's see. There we go. Maybe not. Hang on. Worked this morning, always does, right? Oh. Okay, can you just advance that? There we go. Yep, so so did well behind the plate. Um, actually even uh, got somebody out at the plate, forced play at the plate. I was right there, um, tagged him out, and then probably lost my balance and fell on my behind but um i got him out that was the only thing um, yeah but the umpires can see better all right can you go so this is our team um and uh, our coach gil patterson and um what's really special about this i should have zoomed in the lady in the middle who is not wearing a uniform for those who know baseball that's diana munson who lives actually right over in the akron area she is the widow of thurman munson a uh, former captain of the yankees who was killed in a um, airplane uh, crash many many years ago all right one more and then while we were there we we ran into this guy um, Aaron Judge, because one day we couldn't uh, play out on the fields. Yeah, you know, John Yingling was most excited to see Aaron Judge. Um, all right, you can, thank you. We'll figure this out. Um, yeah, so it was a great time. Um, happy to be back. Um, uh, and uh, happy to be standing in front of you rather than sitting in a rental car in a parking lot speaking to you. Um, you could have turned the heat up before I came back. Um, although it was chilly in Florida too, for their standards. Uh, but I am delighted to be back. Um, and if anybody uh, needs a catcher for a softball team, let me know, I'm your gal. Um, other than that, let us begin this morning by greeting one another on this beautiful January morning. And to those at home, welcome. And um, we're so happy to have you joining us this morning. Thank you, you can have a seat. And as you do, I invite you to join me in our responsive prayer this morning. We gather to worship God. We come from different places and different experiences. We come to sing God's praises. Our voices are different, but our love for God is the same. We come to grow in our faith, so let us pray. Ever faithful God, as we gather in your house this morning, we remember the many ways you have blessed us with your love. Even when we disobey and trust ourselves instead of you, your love pours out for us like a fountain in our lives. So we come into your presence this day with thankful hearts, ready to worship you. Amen. Okay, I'd like to invite my friends to come forward. Oh, let's see. I see that. Excuse me. Okay. The green light is on. All right, I'm gonna get dressed again. Hello, how are you all? Good, it's good to see you. I'm gonna tell you a story today. Actually, you're gonna get a sneak peek of the story. The adults are gonna hear it in just a little bit. Today is a story about baptism. Does that sound familiar to anybody? 
Cora, do you remember what happened just a couple of weeks ago with Isaac? Okay, good, glad you remember. Okay, so this is a story about Jesus's baptism. And baptism happens because people love God and they wanna follow Jesus. Now, when we get baptized, we come to the water. And the reason why we come to the water is because it washes us. Now, when Isaac got baptized a couple of weeks ago, that water was sprinkled on him a little bit or placed on parts of his body. And some people, when they get baptized, like Jesus, go all the way into the water and come back out. A lot of people have a lot of ideas about what's better. And honestly, I really don't think it matters so long as we come to the water. Now, the story is about Jesus getting baptized and you need to know the most important thing. Something amazing happens when he gets baptized, but it's before anything amazing that he does. It all happens before he does something amazing. It happens before he calls his friends to come with him. It happens before he goes to teach people. It happens before he even helps and heals people. Now, he got baptized by his cousin, John. And John was a very interesting person because John lived in the wild lands. Can you say that? Wild lands, exactly. Now, the wild lands were by the River Jordan. And people are not very clear on whether or not the wild lands was a desert, which meant a lot of sand, or if the wild lands were like this big dark forest with lots of rocks. Doesn't matter, it's the wild lands. And John was busy in the wild lands telling anybody who came out to see him, get ready, Jesus is coming. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus came to the wild lands to see his cousin John and to get baptized. Now the thing about baptism with John is that the baptism kind of washed the outside of a person. But the kind of baptism that Jesus is gonna do is that it washes us from the inside out with the Holy Spirit. So here's what happens. Jesus comes to see John in the wild lands and he gets baptized, which means that he goes into the river Jordan and he goes all the way down, 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 down into the water. He probably holds his breath a little bit and then he comes up and then something amazing happens. The heavens open up and from the heavens, the Holy Spirit comes down and it rests right on Jesus. And then the voice of God says, Jesus, you are my son. I love you so much. And I'm so proud of you. Do those sound like good words? Yeah. Would you like to hear those good words? Yeah. yeah, I know, me too. Here's the thing. Those good words were said to Jesus before he did anything that helped to make him famous. And you know what? Those same good words that God spoke to Jesus, those are the same words that God speaks to you. So you know what? You are doing important things right now. Did you know that? You're doing important things like you're learning things in school, right? You're learning how to be a good friend. You're learning how to be a good sister or brother or good family member. And someday, in years to come, you're going to keep doing it important things in the world. We don't even know what those important things are, but it's really important that you remember that God loves you, that God says, you are my child, and I'm so proud of you. Because the truth is, is that after Jesus gets baptized, things get a whole lot harder for Jesus. And he's going to need to remember those good works from God so that he can keep doing what God asked him to do. So when things get hard for you, when things get hard for you, I want you to remember these words. God loves you. God loves you, Gregory. God loves you, Cora. God loves you, Jenna. God loves you, Anna. God loves you, Brian. Thank you. 
important things that are big and important, and even things that don't feel big and important remind us that we love us because we know that things may get hard, and we're going to need to remember that you love us. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Our first scripture is Psalm 62, verses 1 through 8. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ben. Our second reading today comes from Mark's Gospel. Interestingly, Mark's gospel was the first one written historically, even though he gets second billing to, um, to Matthew. But we learn a very um, wonderful scene that uh, we already have previewed, and we really find it referenced in all four of the gospels. But there's a particular reason that I chose Mark's version of this this day. It's Jesus' baptism in the, in the Jordan River, and we find it in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from the heaven said, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, we do thank you. We bless you. We praise you because from you comes all of our blessings, our guidance, our provision, everything that we ever need, we can look to you for, including our awareness of who you are, who Jesus is, and how we can grow in our faith. All of this is in your holy word. So as we seek you this morning, open our hearts and minds and spirits to find you speaking to us even today. Amen. All right, I'm gonna need Kay's help with this since the clickers are not working. But you've all heard it said that a, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? All right, so check out this picture. I don't know how well you can see that. Can you see the look on that little girl's face? Here's another one. <laughs> that is worth a, th you can go on. That is worth a thousand times a thousand words, isn't it? I mean, that is pure joy and excitement all bundled together. 
That is the essence of excitement. I think as we look at this, even though uh, one was a picture and the other one was a, a, a GIF or a GIF or somebody tell me afterwards how I'm supposed to be pronouncing that, um, you, can, you can hear the delight. You can, you can anticipate the paper being ripped off and thrown up into the air. We've probably seen that, right? When children get a present, whether it's their birthday or Christmas or any other holiday, they get so excited. So I'm kind of curious, we just had Christmas. How many of you got that excited about what you got? How many of you would look like one of those pictures, ripped open your Christmas gift or even a birthday gift, threw stuff up in the air? I don't see any, you know, and that's the thing about being adults, isn't it? Somehow, when we become an adult, somehow we think that we have to like, nicely open our gift. I mean, like we're going to reuse the wrapping paper or something, and no offense to those of you who maybe do that. <laughs> I have a box full of bags at home myself. But just imagine if we were that excited about what we were getting, that, that we just couldn't contain ourselves. That's why a little kid does it, right? It's not just because they're a kid that they rip the wrapping paper. It's because they are so excited about what's inside, even if they don't know that they just can't help themselves and the paper gets ripped. Maybe we could take a lesson from that and we, uh, we could start ripping a little bit more paper. Or, or maybe there's something else that we could rip. You see that same kind of excitement that we saw in the picture and the, the gift gif thing with the little kid, the same kind of excitement that kids uh, show us when they're opening a present and ripping it open because they just can't wait to see what's inside. That kind of excitement was in the scripture that I just read to you. I don't know if you caught that or not. Mark, of course, gives the briefest of the descriptions of Jesus's baptism, but in the moment, when Jesus was baptized and he came out before the dove, the Holy Spirit that Lisa was telling the kids about, something happened. Something amazing happened. Something that all of the gospels talk about, but only Mark describes it this way. It's in verse 10. I'll read it for you again. It says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn open torn open, ripped open the heavens. All of the other gospels say the heavens were opened. Nice, polite, kind of like an adult opening a gift. But Mark, he not only uses the term torn, that is an accurate representation of the Greek word. You see, the Greek word, I don't want to weigh you down too much with this, but the Greek word is schizo. Schizo is literally the word from which we get the word scissors in our English today. And it means to split, to rend, to tear apart, and to rip open. So when Mark writes that at the moment Jesus came up out of the water at his baptism, the heavens were ripped open. He's being very literal. And I think he does this because he wants us to know that there was excitement involved in that moment. And of course, it's none other than God's excitement. Because you see, it was God who ripped open the heavens, God who sent the Holy Spirit onto Jesus, God who spoke down and said, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. God tore open the heavens, and I don't presume to know the mind of God, but I have to believe that it's because God was so excited in that moment that like a little kid at Christmas, God couldn't contain the excitement and tore open the heavens in that moment. There was no time for niceties, no time for undoing the little corners of the wrapping paper and pulling the tape off. Now just rip it open so that it can all get started. What gets started? You see this moment, this was a pivotal moment, not only in Jesus's life, but in ours. Because you see, that baby who was born in a manger, the one that we celebrated up here, both with a fake and a living nativity, that baby was born for a purpose. And we know what that purpose was, right? We've heard about it. We celebrate it. We're about to enter the season of Lent. We're going to be preparing for it once again. That baby, as hard as it is to imagine, was born to die. 
That baby came so that he could take the sins of the world, our sins, our mistakes, our pride upon himself, and then die on the cross so that all of that would be put to death as well. And because that was put to death, then we have the opportunity for forgiveness, for salvation, for redemption, and most importantly, for a reunion with God. You see, I think that in the beginning, and I mean that literally, like go to Genesis, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and God created human beings, I am persuaded through all of the reading and study that I've ever done, that God's intention was to have this close, loving, and intimate relationship with humankind. I think that was God's intention all along. I think that's why we're all created. The problem is, is that when Adam and Eve disobeyed, when they decided to do their own thing instead of God's thing, which, by the way, we all repeat in our own lives, usually daily. <laughs> when that happened, then our sin became a barrier to God. Our mistakes, our pride, our thinking that we know better than God became a barrier that separated us from God. This barrier was represented literally in the temple between the holy place and the holy of holies where the presence of God dwelt. There was a huge, massive curtain. We're told that it is literally the depth of a man's hand, not to mention going side to side and top to bottom. God could not be in the presence of God's people. But I don't think that was God's plan. That was not God's intention. I don't think God ever gave up on the intention for which we have all been created. I think God has always wanted to have that close, loving, and intimate relationship with us. And so Jesus came to fix what had been broken, to make a way back to God through the cross and through the empty tomb. And not only back to God in this world, but back to God for eternity. That's what was happening in the Jordan River. Because you see, in that moment, this was the first thing that Jesus did. This was his acceptance of that plan. God had the plan. I think Jesus was in on it. I think they crafted it together. I will go and do this, and it will save the people. We can all be reunited and it'll be what you intended from the very beginning. I can hear Jesus' words in heaven echoing into the, into the ears of the angels. But at this point, Jesus is human. At this point, he has seen a lot of things in his life. And one of the things that we know historically that he had seen over and over and over again was the agony of, of crucifixion. We know because the Romans used it liberally to keep people in line. We know Jesus had seen people suffer. He had watched people die on the cross and then be left hanging there, which was actually the custom. I don't say this to be gross this morning. I say this so that we understand that Jesus knew what lie ahead of him. And in that moment, he had a choice. Don't ever fool yourself and tell yourself that Jesus was obligated to begin his ministry because he knew that his ministry would not be completed until he was hanging on that cross in agony himself, dying for all of us. And so he had a choice. He could stay in the safety and security of the carpentry shop. He could say to his father, God, you know what? Crucifixion is just a little rough right now. I'm going to come back when they have another form of execution. I'm going to come back when it's a little bit easier, when it's less painful. But he didn't do that. In this moment, Jesus made a choice. This moment in the Jordan River, as he is baptized, even though he had no sin of his own, baptized to begin his ministry, baptized to identify with the people that he had come to save, in this moment, Jesus affirmed his choice, began in the Jordan River, but it ended in the borrowed tomb. This is where it all began, and this is what I think God was excited about. Because you see, this was God's plan. Only through Jesus and all that he did for us throughout his ministry, his suffering, his death, and his eventual resurrection, only through all of that can we claim forgiveness. Can we hope to be reconciled with God, have the relationship that we've been created for? So it was the plan all along. But until Jesus stepped into those waters and submitted 
to baptism from his cousin John, it really wasn't off and rolling. It always could get knocked off the rails. And I think God was so excited in this moment when Jesus said, yes, I know what's ahead. I know how awful it's going to be. I know about all the misunderstandings. I know about the suffering. I know about the betrayals. And I'm going through with it anyway. In this moment, that's what was going on. Nobody else knew. To every other onlooker, except for those who heard John say, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which honestly probably left them more confused than anything else. To everybody else, it was just another believer being baptized in the Jordan River, like they had seen so many times before. But Jesus knew. John might have known to some extent. But the one person who absolutely knew was God. And I think in that moment that God was so excited that Jesus had said yes, that this ministry, this plan had started and that this mission was going to be fulfilled and God was going to be able to be reunited with all of God's people, with all of us. I think God was so excited about all of that that like a little kid at Christmas, God couldn't contain himself and ripped open the heavens to get it all started. And just in case you think, I'm being a little hyperbolic about this. Let me tell you that while this might have been the first tearing that Mark tells us about, it wasn't the only one. If you flip a few more chapters into Mark's gospel toward the end, not the beginning, but the end of Jesus's life, in that moment when Jesus breathes his last breath on the cross and gives up his spirit into his father's hands, there's another tearing. Remember that curtain I told you about? That massive curtain in the, in the temple that separated the essence of God from the people of God? That wasn't God's plan. And when Jesus died and forgiveness was possible, salvation was at hand and God's mission was complete, God again got excited. And that curtain was torn. And we are told in the gospels, that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. There's only one way that that could have happened. Only God could tear that curtain. And you know what the best part of all of this is? Is the motivation for it all. God was excited because Jesus was going to make relationship for us possible with God. God was excited about being in relationship with you. That's why the heavens were torn open at Jesus' baptism and why the curtain was torn down at the moment of his death. It was all about you, all about us. Every person that God has ever created, God so desperately desires to have this close, loving, and intimate relationship for which you were created, that God got so excited at even the prospect, the possibility of that, that God rips open like a little kid at Christmas. How does that make you feel? Whatever you've done in your life, it doesn't matter to God. God loves you so much. That's truly the motivation behind all of it. The reason that Jesus made that decision to begin his ministry there in the Jordan, to go to the cross, to suffer, to die, was all because he loved you. Because as Max Lucado puts it in one of his books, it was easier for him to imagine suffering like that than it was for him to conceive of eternity without you. It's all about you. That tearing was God's excitement for you. That's who you are. So let me tell you something. Sometimes in this world, people will tell us that we're not good enough. We don't have enough education. We're not old enough. Something that we've done in our past disqualifies us from being God's people. If you ever hear that again, or if you ever hear somebody else saying that to somebody else, please, will you remember this? Will you remember that God loves you so much that God got so excited at the idea of being in relationship with you that God literally tore open the heavens and then tore down a curtain to be connected with you, to be in relationship with you, to share the love that God has with you so that you would know it in your life, so that you would know the peace, the hope, the joy, all that God has created you for, all that Jesus came to make possible for us. That's what God was excited about. God is excited about you, about me, about all of us. 
Let God be the last word on your life. Tear into it, because I promise you, it's better than any gift you're ever going to get wrapped. Amen. Someday we're going to sing the version of this song that I have. It's called Coffee, Coffee, We Adore Thee. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. In the meantime, as we go forth from this place, our worship here together may end, but may our worship to God always be lifted to the heavens as we seek to follow in Jesus' footsteps, walk the path that he has modeled for us so that we can too embrace God's mission in our world, empowered by the Holy Spirit and remembering that with God, truly, all things are possible. Amen. Amen.